Welcome back to Educator.com's Adobe Premiere Pro CS6 video course. And in this course, we're going to go over some term definitions. Now, let me tell you that understanding video does make your job easier. If you are on a uh, job site and you know that uh, you need to record uh, 720p video, 24 frames, a second um, if you don't know what any of those terms mean what they mean you're going to be um, lost uh, if they're asking you to get the um, the 85 millimeter lens you're going to be lost if they're asking you um, uh, if your video is too hot uh, you're going to be, if you don't know what any of, the, of that stuff is, you're going to be lost. And a lot of those terms we'll go over during the course of these videos. But some of the ones that um, are the base of what you should know, we're going to go over in this video. So the, the first thing we're going to talk about are frame sizes. And the uh, there are some standard frame sizes for video. And this slide here tells you what those sizes are. You have, starting with the smallest, which is this orange one down here, that's NTSC video. That's 720 by 480. And then just to make it so you'll be able to see it, I made this one a little bit bigger for the PAL video. But it's also 720, but it's by 576. So it's the same width. It's just a little bit taller than an NTSC video. And then we get a little bit more detailed. And this, the 720 video, 1280 by 720, is the first of the HD video sizes. These two, NTSC and PAL video, are both uh, standard definition. NTSC is National Television Standards Committee, and PAL is Phase Alternating Line. So... Um, these two are on DVDs and on broadcast television. And um, VHS is even smaller than these. But these are two standard definition video sizes. The 720 video is the first high definition. And as you can see, high definition goes pretty big. But 720 video is the first high definition size. And it's, it's about... This in relation to the NTSC. And then we go to 1080 video, which is 1920 across by 1080 down. And you notice that they're named by how many lines are in the video instead of the entire dimensions. Because a widescreen video that is um, 1080p or 1080i, uh, it will always be 1920 by 1080. So just to shorten it, they just use 1080 or 720 because you know that if they say 720, it's 1280 by 720, just by definition. There's no 1200 by 720 video. It's 1280 by 720, and it's 1920 by 1080. So there's no um, intermediate values in there that you can get confused with. And then we have this big gigantic, there's one in between uh, 2K, which would be about a quarter of this size. But the the big one now is 4K video, which is 4096 by 2160. And you notice that these ones go by the width instead of the height. So you have 2K video, you have 4K, and now there's even 5K coming out, which would be... Um, 5192, I believe, by uh, 27 something, 26 something. But these go by the uh, width of the video instead of the height. So the, the standard definition, uh, the width is 720 by something. And then uh, the high, these high definition are uh something by 720 or 1080 and then the large ones go back to uh 2k 4k or 5k by some other value so those are the standard video sizes and and 
how they relate to how much information. You can notice that standard definition has almost no information compared to 4K video. But um, it's just one of those things that um, if you know the frame size and you know that um, you're going to uh, broadcast at 1080p, you can get a feel for how much information is in that frame and consequently how much storage space it takes inside of your computer for the same size video. So the 720 video is going to use a lot less storage space than the 4K video, which is going to use a whole lot of storage space inside of your computer. So that was the video sizes and the... um the frame sizes, uh, they're also, uh, video is, is, um, defined by either interlaced or progressive. So let me turn this one off and let's look at interlaced versus progressive. Now the, the standard definition is always interlaced. Always. Um, and basically what is, if you look at the, the, uh, image here, you can see there's like a combing effect on the video because this one is is uh, panning to the right. And interlaced means that it'll take, if it's the upper field first, it will take the zero line and draw that. Then the two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, four, and until it gets all the way down to the bottom. And then it'll go back up to the top and do one, three, five, seven, nine. So it's drawing every other line uh 30 times a second so you'll actually have 60 fields in 30 frames per second interlaced video and the first field will be um the even number and the second field will be the odd or if it's lower field first it'll be the odd numbered first and then the even numbers um progressive each frame is standalone there's no um, there's no drawing every other line in progressive. And you can see that it's much cleaner video over here on progressive, which if you have the chance to record in progressive, you want to record in progressive. Now there's, um, and just because of this, the difference between these two, that, uh, that's one of the reasons why 1280 by 720 progressive looks as good as or better than 1920 by 1080 interlaced just because of the nature of the uh the way that the image is made up this 720p will will look cleaner than 1080i even though there's more information in the 1080i uh clip just because of these these um this combing effect when you are panning and zooming and you might uh, look at some of the um, the older VHS tapes, and you will see this on there also. Uh, if it's going to the left or to the right, it will. You'll see these lines uh, in the video. It's hidden a lot by watching it on a regular television, um, just because of the way that the television is made. It's made to show progressive. You know, the old tube televisions. They're made to show progressive video. So it, it hides a lot of the, uh, problems. But this is straight from my video camera. And then I loaded it into Premiere and had it do, uh, it automatically does deinterlacing if it knows that the original is interlaced. And this is what Premiere came out with. And it's, you can see it's, it looks a whole lot better. And it's much easier to read the numbers. It's not so spread out like it is here to make it um, less sharp. So that was the the interlaced versus progressive. Now the next thing we want to go over are frame rates. And there are some common frame rates on video. And 15 frames a second for internet video... That is usually for animation, like flash animation. It go anywhere from 5 to 15 frames a second. And people are used to having that low of a frame rate on animation. Uh, if you use regular video at 15 frames a second, it wouldn't uh, look 
natural. It would look odd just because there's so few frames. Uh, if you want to get natural movement, you want to go up to 24 frames a second, which is what film, most film uses 24 frames a second. Unless it's a high speed camera, you're going to be doing 24 frames a second. That's 24 complete frames on film. Uh, so film is actually the original progressive video because each little frame in there is a complete picture and it's the original uncompressed video because each frame is independent it doesn't need other frames to define it it's an independent piece which is why you go to the movie theater it looks fantastic because it's it's progressive and there's no compression it's just the what what's on the film and that frame is shown but 24 frames is also used for ATSC and that's the American Television Standards Committee and what that is that's our broadcast video that's what our high definition broadcast video uses the ATSC standard for um the uh, compression and the and the broadcast and you notice that it also has these other frame rates that you can use for ATSC that's just one of the the valid frame rates that you can use with ATSC and 24 frames also used for 2k and 4k video so if you are if you have like a red camera or an RE flex camera and you're using 4k video it's going to film at 24 frames a second and that will get you close to or almost exactly what a regular 35 millimeter film strip will get you. It's pretty detailed. Um, it's pretty close to how much you can, f how much detail you can get on a piece of film, but not quite. There's slight differences in the quality of it, but, uh, most people, unless you told them you were using a digital camera, um, and with filters and other stuff, you can make it look like film. They wouldn't even know that it wasn't film. Now, the 25 frames per second, that's the PAL and the CCAM. And the CCAM has mostly been folded into the PAL around the world. The PAL is used for European and um, Middle Eastern countries and uh, various places around the world. And it's it's an alternative to the NTSC. They wanted one that um used simpler uh, electronics so they have pal video and ccam which is a french um i don't know the french word i don't remember the french word for it. we just call it ccam um there's some french phrase that makes ccam but uh this has mostly been folded into the pal video so when you're in a country that uses ccam they can use a PAL television and watch the CCAM broadcasts. Um, and again, ATSC also uses 25 frames per second. So this is only one frame per second more than film. So it's um, pretty close to film, although you'll have to do, uh, you'll have to drop a frame every second to match the film frame. But um, it's one of those, it's, and it does, it's not much. You can slow it down, um, I think two percent and it would, and would get it down to film 24 frames a second. Uh, again, ATSC has 25 and it also has 29.97 for NTSC and ATSC. NTSC is the standard definition and the ATSC is the high definition. Um, it's 29.97 specifically because, um, there's color information in the video. When NTSC first started, it was 30 frames a second. But when they went from grayscale to color, they needed space in there with the uh, uh, lab color space to add the color information to the black and white image. So they dropped 0 0.03 frames a second to add that into the stream that that was being broadcast out to people's houses so you can see how much of the video is actually the uh the grayscale part 
the luminous part and how much is the color part and you can see it only it only needed that tiny little bit of space to add all of the color information into the image um, almost the entire thing is the grayscale part of the image so with 29.97 frames a second you'll lose two frames about two frames every minute uh, in in your uh, total frames but ATSC also has 30 frames a second uh, if you're actually broadcasting NTSC in grayscale which I don't know anybody that does but if you can't you can you can have that as 30 frames a second uh, with no problem um, if somebody's watching on a one of those original grayscale televisions it will display the image at 30 frames a second if you're broadcasting at that at that rate um, and the grayscale televisions will also do the color 29.97 just because they had to at the time because as soon as they started changing to color not everybody changed their television and they still needed to be able to see the uh, the video on their on their black and white TVs which is actually grayscale it's not black and not just black and white is grayscale but it's one of those um, those anomalies of television that uh, you should know about with the um, uh, how many frames a second there are so the ATSC that's the one that we broadcast at now and that's um, uh, the one that if you're making commercials or other things you want to you want to do it as an ATSC uh, I recommend if you're sending out commercials uh, it's still it depends on the TV station but if you're sending out commercials to play on broadcast television most likely you're going to do them at uh, uh, 1280 by 720 at 24 frames progressive uh, and most likely you'll do 5.1 sound uh, sometimes stereo if you don't if you don't uh, uh, have any music in it you can do stereo but I've always done 1280 by 720 24p 5.1 uh, Dolby Digital and that's what you're going to output to your um, tape to send to the station or just an out some some of them now just accept straight video files and they will play them straight from the uh, from the mp4 files or the mov files the move files so those are all the common frame rates uh, if you're having 60 frames a second uh, most likely you're doing slow motion because then when you um, when you drop the speed to 50 percent inside of premiere it'll be a smooth slow motion at half speed uh, that's Usually the only reason you want 60 frames a second is to do slow motion. Otherwise, you're just wasting space on your um, on your little uh, memory card that you're recording your, your video to. So those are all of the, the common frame rates. Now, when you're inside of um, uh, a video editing program, the you have two different types of... Uh, time codes you have non drop frame and drop frame and remember how I told you this 29.97 frames per second was so they could add the color information and you'll drop two frames every minute except every tenth minute um, that's what this one is this is the drop frame if you have 29.97 or you have 23.975 you're gonna have a drop drop uh drop frame time code which is the standard time code except that there is right before the frame numbers there is a semicolon the non drop frame which would be 30 24 25 that would be a standard time code except that there is a colon before the frame numbers and these are the zero one is the hours this next set is the minutes this next set is the seconds and then the last two are the frames so if you're at one hour five minutes that would be zero five uh, 17 seconds would be one seven and then 14 frames would be one four here and that's how you read that so if you have um, 
let's say two minutes, four seconds, and five frames, that would be 204 and five frames. That's how you would say that on your, if you're telling somebody, go to 204 and five frames. They know it's two minutes, four seconds, and five frames. And that's how you, uh, that's how the time code works in it. And if you're at 25 frames a second, this will go from zero to 24. If you're at uh, 30 frames, this would go from zero to 29, and then it rolls back over, and then your your seconds goes up, and this goes back to zero. So it's just like a standard counting, except it's whatever your frame rate is would be. Um, one less than this is the maximum that you would see here. So the next thing we want to talk about is compression. And what that is, is instead of just sending the entire signal like they do with standard broadcast, uh, the standard definition broadcast, they compress it down so it doesn't take up so much space in the air. Uh, the waves for television are about three feet high and... Um, they use a lot of the bandwidth. They can fit uh, 6 to 10 high-definition channels in one standard-definition space just because they compress the video down. And let's look at some of the common video compression schemes. Uh, MPEG-1 was the original, and that's used for VCD. And those are... Um, VCD is Video CD. And it's basically taking regular video um, and saving it onto a CD, and then you can watch a movie from a CD instead of a DVD. Now it uses it; it's a it's almost about the same as a VHS tape, so it's not very high definition. It's only about 320 lines, um, but you can use. When they were much cheaper to get CDs than DVDs, a lot of people started recording on CDs instead. I, I believe it came from the Chinese government uh, started uh, backing the video CD just because they didn't want to pay the royalties for the DVD. So they started, uh, they created the video CD and then it spread. It's It was mostly used and I believe it's still used a lot in... Um, Asian countries and in the United States you go to some Asian parts of town and they'll still sell you VCDs of movies and I believe that Hollywood still creates some of them um, but most of the movies you'll see are from China and other Asian countries that uh, didn't want to pay the licensing fee for DVD so DVD is actually used MPEG-2 now, the MPEG is the Motion Picture Experts Group, and the 1 and the 2 are two different um, ways of compression. And the MPEG-1 was the first one, and then the, that didn't have a licensing fee. They released that. Anybody can use the MPEG-1 compression for free. The MPEG-2 originally for DVD, you had to license the compression. You couldn't just use it and then sell it. I mean, you could use it for personal use, but you couldn't then sell DVDs with MPEG-2 without paying your licensing fee to um, the Motion Picture Experts Group, which is in Los Angeles. Um, it's one of those things that eventually they just let it go. Now anybody can uh, do MPEG-2 compression for DVDs and then sell it. If I burn a disc, I, I can go sell it with MPEG-2 without having to worry about getting um, arrested for <laughs> using the wrong compression without paying for it. And it's also used for ATSC video, which is the um, the high-definition broadcasting that we talked about previously. And MPEG-2 is mostly used for a... Um, uh, if they're still broadcasting a sub-channel on standard definition, which a lot of them still do, they do 480p or 480i video um, through ATSC. It's on like channel 6.2 or channel 10.1. It'll be an, an alternate channel, uh, not 10 point, like 10.3. It'll be an alternate channel um, 
that piggybacks along with their main HD stream. And it's usually MPEG-2 uh, standard definition. Some of the bigger ones like in LA, bigger markets, their um, secondary and tertiary channels are high definition. But a lot of the smaller markets, um, it's just MPEG-2 video that's piggybacking on. And then um, ATSC also uses the AVCHD uh, codec, which right now I can't remember what what uh, AVCHD or VC1 stands for. But that is also used for Blu-ray discs. And it's also used if you have one of the video cameras that records um, to a, like a flash drive or, or I mean a SD card or one of those other uh, recording cards. It'll Most of the time it'll use AVCHD which um, you can then bring into Premiere directly off of the card and edit it if you needed to. Um, we don't recommend that, but you can if you want to. Um, it's just another compression scheme that's much better than um, MPEG-1 or MPEG-2. And um, the VC-1, it's only used for Blu-ray. It's just another compression scheme that's uh, valid for Blu-ray. And um, if you, it's not listed here, but if you have like a DSLR, that's going to use H.264 video, which is related to these, the AVCHD. But it's um, um, it's a little bit different. It'll it'll save it as dot, like a dot mov a dot move file, and um, you can edit that directly in Premiere also. But any of these you can bring directly into Premiere Pro, and it will be able to work with any of these video compression schemes. And these are the ones that are most used. Um, Right now, the AVCHD, I believe, is based off of H.264. And the next thing we want to go over are aspect ratios, because there's several different aspect ratios uh, for video. And here are the main aspect ratios. This inside box, this light gray box, that is 4 by 3. So you're talking about for every, f uh, if there's four units of length here, there's three height. So um, if this was four inches, this would be three inches. And that is standard definition. It's four by three. It's a regular, the, the old TV size. That's what that size is. The new television sizes are this dark gray box here which is 16 across by 9 down. So if this is 16 inches from here, from here, this spot to here, it would be 9 from top to bottom. And that is standard. It's not standard, but it's, it's the, the default high definition aspect ratio is 16 by 9. And then when you get into movie theaters, you have wider video and you have this this little sliver here to this sliver here is the uh, 1.85 to 1. So you can see that 1.33 to 1 is the smallest one. Then it gets a little bit wider, a little bit wider. And then the widest one here, the entire box here, is the 2.35 to 1, which is uh, the standard movie width uh, nowadays for widescreen movies. And almost all movies are widescreen. And they they have a regular 2.35 to 1 aspect ratio. So here are the common aspect ratios. All of these will be available. All of these slides for you to download. Um, and I will go over that later on. But um, those are your standard aspect ratios. Now, the types of shots... Um, these are some shot types that you should know uh, before you get, if you're doing the filming, you should know what these types of shots, if they say, I want a two shot, you should know what they're talking about. If you say, um, I want a slow-mo of this, then you should know what that's talking about. 
If they want an uh, extreme close-up, you should know what they're talking about. And I'm going to show you a little video, and I'll talk during the video so uh, you can hear, uh, I can tell you what you would use these shots for. And it's not every single type of shot, and this video will be available for you to download, uh, but it won't have the narration I'm about to give you. Um, but it will go over the most common types of shots that you might be asked to do. Um, we'll go ahead and let me turn the sound off. And let's play it. And I will tell you um, what each of these shots are as they come up. So here's your wide shot. And you notice that it's a little bit farther away. Um, you get the entire view of the entire area here. And then here's the mid shot. You get a little bit closer. And as we go through these, we'll get closer and closer to our actor. Um, and then we have our medium close up, which is a little bit closer. You notice that it's about the waist up. And then, uh, the next one will be the, the close up which is usually you see part of the shoulders and then the full head. And um, the next one is usually used for like uh, westerns and it's called the extreme close-up where they get just one small section of somebody or they, sh they show some tiny little object and they, they bring the camera really close and you get an extreme close-up. The cut-in is if you're doing like an interview and you want to um, have a piece that you can cut in so it's not just a static shot, you can use the cut-in. The point of view is what a person would see. If you have somebody looking out a peephole, that's their point of view. It's not showing them looking out, it's what they actually see. The tracking shot is used for, uh, as you can see, it's following along on the side of a moving subject. And the dolly shot is either coming forward or backward, following them from the front or from the back. Now the zoom, everybody knows what a zoom is. It's either coming in close or pulling out. That's what the zoom is for. The establishing shot you'll see at the beginning of uh, a lot of uh, television shows. It'll do an establishing shot so you can see where the action is about to take place. So after the establishing shot, it'll go inside and show you the scene uh, of the actors interacting. The low angle, it's pretty obvious what low angle is. And then um, the opposite is high angle. That's pretty obvious too. Um, it's just having the camera pointing uh, up or down, depending on which one you're using. Uh, the lean in, uh, we're going to lean in to the uh, display here, and then we'll lean back out. And that's a standard shot on especially how-to shows. And then the naughty is, this is another one where you can cut it into an interview. So you could have a one shot of the actor here, and then you the naughty is um, just to break it up. So it's not just a static shot of one person talking. It, it'll it cut to the interviewer nodding their head. It's just like, and that's what, that's called a naughty shot. And it's, it's usually only used for a few seconds, just enough to have them. And then here's the two shot. You see two people in the shot. Um, I don't know if I have the one shot, but a one shot would be just the one person and you wouldn't see any of the other person. Uh, that's different from, um, I believe the over-the-shoulder shot. There's the over-the-shoulder, where uh, over-the-shoulder you see part of one person, and then it shows the other person. The one shot would just be the one actor, and you don't see any of the other person. So the interviewer wouldn't even be visible in the one shot, or the the interviewee wouldn't be visible in the one shot of the interviewer. And then the next type of shot, um, we have the freeze frame. And 
that's actually pretty easy to do. You find the one frame you want to freeze on and make sure that there's, you can see that there's no movement in that one frame. So there's no blurriness. And then you export that one frame and you can have it last as long as you want. And you cut the video right at that frame and then you put the static frame right after it and you can have a freeze frame for however long you want. Um, the whip pan is usually no more than a second or two. I have it here much longer just because of the, um, so we can read, you can read what this, um, what type of shot it is. But that's used to go from, uh, one location to another really quickly. And it's, it's just a, it's a transition that will break up the, the video so it, you can, um, see, um, It'll make a logical change to another location. And you see it's not going to be this long on a regular video. It's just maybe a second or two. And then we have the jump cut. If you watch here, watch your arms. And you see it jumps right there. Um, let's look at it again just so you can see what the jump is right there. And you can see that it's, it's, uh, it's a jump that that um, uh, shouldn't be there. It's jarring. It, it It's not continuous. And the naughty shot uh, or the uh, cut in, you could put over that jump and it's, they won't, your viewer won't even see the jump. That's what naughty shots are done and cut ins are done specifically for to cover up a jump cut like that. And then you have slow motion and you can see that suddenly she's walking really slow and then um, this last shot the montage sequence you'll notice she goes from here to here to here to here and uh, what that is is to show the passage of time but without having to show all of the stuff in between and that is usually used for like sports movies where the guy is First, you see him doing sit-ups and then push-ups and then uh, he's lifting weights, he's running, and it'll cut between each of those different things to show you there's a passage of time and all this stuff is happening, but it's compressing it down to maybe a few minutes and then they have a single song that plays through the entire sequence and it pushes the narrative along without having to go through and say, well... He started doing 30 reps of 15 push-ups and, and then he went to... You just show him doing all this stuff in a sequence and there's a nice dissolve between all of them and it tells the viewer um, what happened in the interceding amount of time. So there's our, a lot of the major types of shots you might be doing. Um, again, you will be able to download that video uh, and take a closer look at it um, later on. There's two other things I want to talk about, uh, and that is A-roll and B-roll. The A-roll, like if you're doing an interview with somebody, the A-roll would be the actual interview video where um, you have the camera trained on the interviewer, you have another one trained on the interviewee, and you have another one on the two-shot which shows both of them. That is your A-roll. And uh, your B-roll would be anything that you cut in to cover either cuts or explanatory. Like if you have video of your interviewee doing woodworking and you're doing an interview about woodworking and they're talking about using a drill press, you can cut in a B-roll of them actually using the drill press as part of the video. And it keeps, it makes... It more interesting than if you just stay on a static shot of somebody being interviewed and don't change to anything else. It adds interest to the viewer. It it um, uh, brings them into whatever your whatever story you're trying to tell. So your B roll is very important if you are the person that's recording video for a project. You want to make sure that you get a lot of B roll, and that includes establishing shots. That includes um, cut-ins um, that includes any 
any naughty shots, anything that you can cut in to make your video not static. Because uh, if, if you just have a, you ever watch C-SPAN and you see a video of, say, um, uh, some meeting that they're having in Congress and they put the camera directly on the person being interviewed and it just stays there. Now, they don't do it so much anymore. They do more cut-ins with um, uh, C-SPAN. But in the beginning days, they would put the camera on and it would just stay there. And it's very, very boring to watch. Now they do cut-ins. They'll show the room. They'll show the guy asking the question. You know, they'll go back and forth. But when C-SPAN started, it started, they just set the camera and didn't move it. And now it's... It's much easier to watch just because they do all of the cut-ins and stuff. It just makes your video much better. So if you can get B-roll when you're out doing, like if you're doing a documentary, you get somebody doing a bunch of, of the things that they're going to be interviewed about, you can then cut them in and uh, make your video much better. Now, before we continue on with the... Um, the rest of the lessons, I want to talk about some of my, my personal teaching philosophy. Just so you know, as we go through this, um, where I'm coming from in these videos. And the main thing I want to talk about is um, having you try a lot of this stuff. I've uploaded a whole bunch of these source videos to a website that you can go download them. I'll give you the link at the end. But um you can you can download a bunch of this of uh, the videos and do all this stuff yourself and i highly recommend you do that this is one of those things that um i could sit and talk to you for hours and hours and hours and tell you what you can do in premiere but it's much better that you get in there and start doing this stuff yourself experiment with video effects experiment with audio effects experiment with transitions do all of your experimentation in there. Find out how all of these different things work in there. How what the ribble edit tool does, what the rolling edit, the slip and the slide tool, what what they all do and how they work, because it will it will um, make you a much better editor if um, you have gone through and you use the um, the slide edit. And then they come in and they say, well, I need you to move this here just like this. And then you realize, hey, that's a slide edit. I can just grab the slide and move it and I'm finished. It's one of those things that um, I'm not one to just say, well, just listen to what I say. And then hopefully you remember some of it. I'm more of get in there, start using it, learn the keyboard shortcuts, learn um what all the tools do, 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 learn what all of the, um, the video effects are. Get a list of all the video effects that are available and just go through them one by one and figure out what they do and why they do what they do and all of the settings that you can do. Uh, learn what a garbage mat is. Learn what green screening does. Uh, compositing, alpha channels. All of these things are things that, um, we'll go over some of them in these videos. We'll go over some of the things that you can do with them. But most of the stuff, I want you to go through and experiment on your own because you might hear me talk about how a green screen works and, and when you would use it and uh, the best ways to get the, the green to disappear in your video to make an alpha channel. But um, until you actually get in and start doing stuff, it's all academic. Um, so that is my personal teaching fossa. And I might be going through and I'm talking about something and I go, oh yeah, let me show you this thing real quick. Um, that's just the way that, that I teach. If I see something and I know that you can use it, I will stop really quick, show it to you, and then get back to whatever I was doing before. And that's just something that I've done in front of classes because I'm used to people asking me to to do um questions about what I'm teaching. So if I'm in there and I remember that a lot of students are wondering about some specific thing, I will go, oh yeah, let me show you this. And I will show it to you really quick. 
And that's just because these videos, you're not directly asking me while I'm recording the videos what questions you have. But I might remember some from previous things that I've uh, shown students. So um, I might have a few of these. I'm not sure if I will or not. But if I suddenly say, hey, let me show you this real quick, you know that it's not directly related to what we're doing, but it's something that you might want to know and um, you might want to write it down just so you have it as a reference. And writing stuff down, um, even if you never look at what you've written, helps you to remember a lot when you are learning something. So that's just something I've picked up from from teaching is that if you write something down, people, even if they don't look at it, they will remember it um, much easier. So that was our term definitions here in our course. Um, hopefully you come back and watch the rest of the videos and learn about editing video in our Adobe Premiere Pro CS6 back here on educator.com. Thank you.